Good day everyone, welcome back to the vlog. It's currently about 6.30am here in Melbourne and I am raring to go. I've got my new monitor, I've got my new webcam, everything should be solid for us to get another vlog out for all of you. The plan for today is to play 1,500 hands of online 9-handed 50 cent one games. I'm already fully fed and raring to go, so why waste any more time? Let's get straight into the poker. Welcome back, we're in the afternoon now and I've just wrapped up my second poker session for the day. Fortunately, over the course of the two sessions, I was able to surpass my 1,500 hand goal, getting in 1,577 hands, which I am absolutely stoked with. Something else that, you know, I'm pretty stoked with as well are the results, because I did make 321 across the course of both of those sessions, and you can actually tell by the graph here, it was a pretty slow start to the day, but then right at the end, I surged back with some run good and was able to book a win. Now to get a fully formed idea of how I actually played throughout the course of this session, I've got seven brand new hand histories that we're going to go over in depth. Before that though, I need to come down after my session, take a bit of time to relax and eat, so I'm going to do that, but then we'll get the hand history analysis out for you when I'm feeling nice and fresh either later today or maybe even tomorrow morning if I don't feel up to it later today. I just need to cool down first, so I'm going to do that. But in vlog time, we're going to get straight onto the hand history, so let's go. Welcome back everyone. It is 10 to 7 in the morning, so we're one day removed from the session I played yesterday. Really did not feel like I had the energy to go through these seven hand histories in detail for all of you, so I slept on it. Come back this morning, I woke up about an hour and a half ago and had some chicken and broccoli for breakfast, which was spot on. That hit the spot. Now I'm feeling better, ready to go over these hand histories. So, not much more time to waste. Let's get into it. First hand, we have queen three of clubs in the big blind. When we get a cutoff open for three X and it falls to us, I think this is a pretty good hand to defend with in the big blind. We're getting a good price to see a flop and a suited queen. It's not the best hand in the world, but if I just fold every time the cutoff opens three, I am going to be massively exploited. So I do decide to throw in the defend with queen three suited, and then we go to a flop. Queen 10, 9, rainbow. We do have backdoor clubs as well as top pair. I go ahead and naturally check it over to the preflop aggressor. Then they throw out a C bet of about two thirds the size of the pot. Pretty easy decision to call here with top pair. So we go to the turn. It's a banger turn. It is the three of spades. I go ahead and check it over to the villain again, just hoping that they're gonna keep betting if they do have a strong one bear hand or a bluff. They go ahead and bet 12, so pretty large bet considering the size of the pot. And the action's on me here, and I think we have a pretty interesting decision whether we want to check raise or just call. Um, I think the better play, in 100% honesty, is to check raise here. This is a wet board. There's flush draws I can get called by. There's a few one pairs that have like open-ended straight draws, so if my opponent is betting queen jack, you know they're probably going to call a check raise because they have outs to improve to a straight. So I think that's the better play. As played, though... I decided to just call. I think this is a mistake. My thinking at the time was I was actually overestimating how strong my opponent's range is in this spot. I sort of assumed, well, even if they are betting off aces or kings or ace-queen here, they're probably just going to fold to a check raise, which I think there is, like, that is potentially true, but I just don't think I can sort of let them catch a river for free in position when I do have a hand that can raise up for value. Regardless, so we go heads up to the river, which is the jack of spades. Absolutely awful river for me. We lose to backdoor spades. We lose to any king or any eight. So definitely going to go ahead and check it over to the villain. They go ahead and bet 30. The action's back on me here and really wish an idea to check raise on the turn now. This is a very, very gross spot with my two pair. When my opponent bets this size on this board, they're essentially saying they have a king and it just comes down to uh, do I believe that they have a king or not and I actually am very inclined to believe that they do have a king just because I can't think of like what combination of hands this person would use as a bluff. Like if they did bet two streets with, like I, I guess pocket aces would actually be a good hand to use as a bluff, but like you just don't see that in the pool. People just check back aces either on the turn or on the river for sure, given this line. And they do have showdown value with ace high. It, for them to find a bluff on this board that I 
beat with queen three, it'd have to be something totally obscure, like pocket sixes, or just something they kept barreling off with. So the fact that they are betting this size, and they do have kings in the range, they have king queen, even like ace king, or you know backdoor spades for value as well. I just I just totally believe them, and I can't pay them off. So I do go ahead and fold two pair on the river. Ugh. Sick way to start the session, but. I do think we probably saved ourselves at least 30 by not calling on the river there, so I'll take that small win. Next hand, we have a much stronger hand. We have Ace King in the cutoff. The action gets to the hijack, and they're a loose passive player, so they go ahead and limp. It's no surprise. We're definitely going to ISO with our Ace King. I go ahead and make a five. And the action gets to a tight player in the big blind. They go ahead and call call the five, and then the limp calls as well. So we're three ways to a flop. Ace, Queen, 7, Rainbow. Pretty nice flop for us. When the action checks to me, I definitely want to go ahead and bet for value here. I think um, the cold caller can definitely have a lot of like stronger aces, like Ace, Jack, and Ace, 10. So I definitely want to get value from those. But also the Limp Caller, actually, I actually think there's more value to get from them because they're going to be Limp Calling with like Ace, 2 suited, Ace, 9 off suit. And like this is just because they're never going to fold to a bet on the flop here so i really think the best play would actually be to bet big here just because there is a lot of value to be had i go ahead and bet six which is a bit too small in my opinion i would have rather made it something like 9 10 11 regardless so i bet six and then the big blind check raises to 18 the limper gets out of the way and then the action's back on me i think for pretty easy decision to call on this street at least one time. I did bet a bit smaller, which potentially could have induced a bluff from this villain. They're probably calling with King Jack and King 10, which are gut shots that they can send me a bluff with. Also somewhat possible that they're check raising Ace Jack or Ace 10, just because I did bet small, just to do a bit of protection bet, but definitely not looking to three bet Ace King here. I am somewhat concerned the opponent does have Ace Queen or Pocket Sevens or even Ace Seven suited. So don't want to get too saucy with a three bet here. Easy decision to just call. Go to the turn, which is the 10 of spades. Big blind checks it over to me, which is pretty interesting. I think that if they did have ace queen or pocket sevens, I probably would just continue barreling off. So I have to ask myself, should I bother like continuing to bet to try and get value from, I guess it'd have to be ace jack specifically that did protection raise. And I decide not to, I decide to check here. And the reason for this is I actually am still somewhat concerned I am behind. Like I said, if my opponent did have a bluff on the flop, I think a hand like King Jack would make a lot of sense. And King Jack just got there. And if they did, you know, check raise a hand for value, and then they're checking just to try and induce a bet from Ace King, essentially. Like, I don't want to fall into that trap. I do think that they still have a lot of very strong hands in their range here. And even if they do have a weaker hand, like King 10 or Jack 10, which were gut shots that now have a pair, like, they're just going to fold those when I bet. So I'm sort of in the mindset, if I go ahead and bet here, there's just no value to get from worse hands. And if I get check raised, like, I'm going to fold anyway. So I just don't want to put myself in that spot. So I do mix in the check back. Then we're off to the river. It's a seven of clubs. This is a pretty good river for us because it limits the amount of combinations of pocket sevens and a seven that my opponent can have. Regardless though, they still go ahead and bet the size of the pot. So this is a pretty gross spot. Part of me really, really wants to call here with ace king. One, because it's the strongest hand we have here. I'm pretty sure like if we had any, you know, two pair hand, we, or stronger, we would have just bet the turn. It is the strongest hand in my range, so I should be calling from a theoretical standpoint, but I really don't want to call at the same time. And that's just because, as I explained on the flop, I still think my opponent can have ace queen or pocket sevens in their range, even though the river blocks it. I also think they can have king jack as well. So because of that, I do decide to go ahead and fold. In retrospect, I'm not really sure how I do feel about this fold. And even if they are bluffing, like they'd have to be turning like a jack 10 into a bluff or something, which would probably be a pretty good play from them. And I, I guess I guess if I had the decision back, I would call just because of that. Next hand, the action folds to me in the small blind with jack 8 off suit. I go ahead and open it up to 4, just looking to steal the big blind, essentially. Doesn't work though, because they do mix in the call. So we go heads up to a flop of jack 10 5, flop and top pair, gonna go ahead and bet it for value. I go ahead and size up, I make it 7 for two reasons. One is we're out of position, so if the opponent is inclined to fold here, 
Like we want calls when we do have top pair, but if they fold at the same time, like we're pretty happy to not play the pot out of position going forward. But two is a very wet board. And I actually think there's a wide range of hands my opponent can call with. They could have a flush draw, they could have a straight draw, they could have, you know, even if they do want to call with a 10, we want max value with it. So I go ahead and bet seven and then they do call. So we're heads up to the turn, two of clubs. The action's on me here. And I think this is a pretty interesting decision whether we want to keep betting or not. I think the better play probably is to keep betting just because this two of clubs, it doesn't improve any of the draws. We can still get called by a hard draw, by the straight draws, you know, king, queen, bet something like 16, 17. I decide to check. I think I was being a bit too timid in this spot. There are some hands in our opponent's range that we lose to, namely just stronger jacks. I think any two pair type hands would have raised on the flop considering the board's so wet but i just shouldn't be that concerned about it when there's such a wet board and there are so many hands we can get value from so i'm not in love with this check then the opponent goes ahead and bets the size of the pot pretty gross we don't like that they definitely do have the stronger jacks in their range but they have so many draws open-ended straight draws flush draws there's backdoor flush draws now you know they could definitely have jack x of clubs even though we do have the eight of clubs which makes that a little bit less likely so there are a few hands we lose too but at the same time not going anywhere on such a wet board with top pair. I throw in the call, heads up to the river. Eight of hearts, very interesting river. We make two pair ourselves now, but front door flush gets in. I go ahead and check it over to the aggressor. Then they go ahead and bet the size of the pot again. Absolutely sick spot with our river two pair here. But I don't think my opponent is value betting a weaker hand. Like if they have jack two suited, they're not going ahead and betting the size of the pot when the front door flush draw gets there on the river. So essentially they're saying, I, they're not even saying they like have a set, they're essentially saying, I got there with my flush and now I'm betting the size of the pot. And when we have two pair, it's like, do we believe them? Do we not believe them? Is what it comes down to. I do believe them. And the reason I do believe they have a flush here is because they called out the big blind. They're calling out the big blind with a bunch of suited cards, like any ace X suited, any king X suited. You know, even hands like a four, three of hearts would like be a totally reasonable call out of the big blind. So I just think they have so many combinations of flushes in their range. They're representing a flush. I'm going to give them credit for it. I go ahead and fold the river again. In this spot, I'm actually really happy with this river fold just because I totally believe that they have a flush here. Next hand, we have the best hand in all of poker, pocket aces. So when the action gets to a loose passive small blind and they go ahead and limp, I mean, come on, if I'm going to ISO with any hand, I mean, please. I go ahead and make it five and then the limp does call. So we go heads up to a flop. It's a banger. Ace, king, jack with two diamonds. And here's where things get interesting. The small blind actually leads out into me. And I'll be honest, I'm actually kind of confused in this spot. I'm not sure what they're leading. Like, is it strong? Is it weak? I'm really not sure what to make of it. So I do decide to just call just because I am confused. I think raising probably is a better play considering there's so many. King Queen has a gut shot as well as a pair type hands. You know, they could be leading with a flush draw that's definitely going to call a raise as well and they are pretty short stack so we can just try and get all in as soon as possible with the aces that might be a better play i just got a bit confused by their unconventional line and i decided to just call so we go heads up to a turn turn is the ten of diamonds i don't need to tell you but this is an awful turn card for me not only is any queen a straight but if my opponent did lead with a flush draw they just got there so the action's on them. They keep betting at it. They go ahead and bet two thirds the size of the pot. When the action's on me here, like no brainer decision, easy, just call. I'm not looking to raise and get stacked by a queen or a flush. So I just call, hoping the board pairs on the river. Wouldn't you know it? 10 of clubs, the action's on the villain. They go ahead and check it over to me. And now I think we have a pretty interesting decision in terms of what size we're going to value bet. If I was going to bet smaller, it would be to not try and scare off a queen. I do think if we go ahead and overbet, rip it all in, there is some possibility the opponent does just like hero fold, king queen or ace queen. Having said that though, I do think ripping it all in as an overbet is the much better play just because if our opponent does have a flush, which I, as I said, I think there is a bunch of flushes in their range, we're just gonna get max value with it. I go ahead and rip it all in, trying to get paid off by a flush. And then my opponent calls and 
They called me the Queen. I'm super glad that I didn't try and size it down because a loose passive opponent, they're not even going to be able to get scared off a Queen on this run out. So absolutely stoked with this hand. I chose to overbet rip the river and we rake in a big one there. Next hand, the action folds to a tight aggressive cutoff who goes ahead and opens it up to three. And then literally everyone in between us throws in the call. So the action's on me in the big blind with a six of hearts. And I actually think this is a really good spot to call with this hand in particular, just because like in a multi-way pot, you really don't want to be calling out of the big blinds often, just because you want a strong range of hands to compete against the multiple other ranges. You're going to have to try and beat in the hand. But I think a six suited specifically is like a perfect hand to defend with just because it this equity does really well in multi-way pods because it's going to flush over flush people more often than, you know, if I had like 8-6 suited, for example, here. So I throw in the call here with the A6 suited. And we go four ways to a flop. Pretty good flop for us. We flop nut flush draw on queen jack four. Go ahead and check it over to the pre-flop aggressor. They go ahead and bet eight. The button and the small blind fold. The action's on me here and I decide to just call here. And the reason for this is we do have showdown value with our ace high. And I actually do think the cutoff has a pretty strong range of hands here, being that they're a tight aggressive opponent betting into three people on the flop. I just don't think I'm going to get many folds with a check raise I call. Heads up to the turn. That's what I call a banger turn. We turn the nuts on the Knight of Hearts. Now the action's on me here, and I actually think already we have a pretty interesting decision with what we want to do, whether we want to lead or check it over to the aggressor. I decide to check it over to the aggressor. I think this might be a bit of a mistake. I think the opponent definitely does have a strong range of hands and it's a strong range that a lot of them are gonna be calling. Like they can definitely have turned a straight here if they have king 10, they can definitely have sets, they could have over pairs. I do think there is a lot of value to get from those range of hands and I think leading out here for a very large sizing would probably be a really good idea. Regardless though, I go ahead and check it over to the opponent who keeps on betting. They go ahead and bet half pot and I definitely want to go ahead and check raise my nut flush for value here. We can get called by worse flushes. And if my opponent does have um, a set, they're also going to have to call as well to try and boat up on the river. And additionally, like, I don't think I'm going to get any more value if my opponent has, like, black pocket kings, for example. Like, they're just going to shut down on the river. Unless they, even if I hit a set, there's going to be a four liner. So, yeah, I just have to go ahead and check raise for value now. I'll go ahead and make a 42. Then the opponent calls. We love it when the opponent calls. I think their range here is down to those sets. They could have Australia, they could have worse flash. So it's a strong range of hands, but we're ahead with the nuts. We go to a river. River's a seven of clubs. Very happy to see the board not pair on the river. Now the action's on me, and it's a pretty interesting decision. What size I want a value bet. I think my opponent is probably gonna fold any non-flush hand to a large bet here. So I could size down to try and give a set or, you know, pocket kings a good price to call. But honestly, I'd rather bet really big. I think there is a bunch of flushes in my opponent's range. King, queen, queen, 10, seven, eight of hearts, 10, eight of hearts also probably opening in the cutoff. So there are a bunch of really strong hands that we can get value from by betting really, really big here. Just going to sacrifice a bit of value when our opponent does fold a set. I go ahead and make it 147, putting the opponent all in as another river over bet, and then they go ahead and call. Loving that news. We're gonna scoop in this pot, and our opponent had queen 10 of hearts, so pretty brutal turn for them, and absolutely stoked till they check raise the turn and got it all in on the river, because they're never folding this hand to the river shove. Next hand, the action folds to a tight aggressive button. It goes ahead and opens it up to three. Then the small blind folds, and the action's on me in the big blind with ace-jack offsuit. And I think the best play here is probably to just go ahead and three bet. And the only reason I say that is because of how deep the effective stacks are. About 200 big blinds, so probably a lot of value to get here against a button open. I decide to just call, though. You definitely do want some strong aces in your calling range when the button opens, but... I think there's probably more merit to just going ahead and three betting and trying to get value that way. Regardless, so heads up to a flop of 10-9-3 with two hearts. Go ahead and check it over to the pre-flop aggressor. They go ahead and C bet half pop. The action's back on me here and I have two different options. The first option folding off of the table. No way I'm folding this hand with a backdoor nut flush draw and two overs and a backdoor straight draw as well. No chance. 
I think there's actually a lot of merit to check raising here, and the reason is it's a great hand to use as a bluff on later streets because we're going to have a bunch of flush draws, having called out the big blind, and if the turns are hard, like we can very credibly represent some flushes. I just want some hands in that range that I can bluff with as well. So I think particularly against a tight aggressive opponent who's going to be able to, you know, read board text as well, etc. I definitely do want to balance my range and at least have a few bluffs. And this seems like the perfect hand to use in that range. So go ahead and mix in the check raise. I'll go ahead and make it 13. And then the button does call. So we're still heads up to a turn. Turn, it's a repeat 10, a repeat a top pair. This is a pretty bad turn for us. It totally limits the amount of hands that we were strong hands we were representing on the flop 10-9 or um, I guess even like 10-3 suited and this card here it reduces the amount of combinations of those hands I have in my range drastically so I really don't think this is a good card for me to continue bluffing on so I do go ahead and check I'll also note that I do think if I did have like a 10-9 I probably would be checking here sometimes just to you know give my opponent a chance to hit a, you know a strong pair or give them a chance to hit their flush and build a bigger pot that way so it is a good balance line to mix in particularly against a tight aggressive reg they go ahead and check as well so we get a free river the river's a four of hearts now the action's on me and i think this is really interesting because like i said when i made the decision to check raise the flop the plan was to go ahead and represent a flush on you know if there was a heart got there on a later street when you know what a heart got there so i definitely want to go ahead and bluff here and I actually think it's a really good spot to overbet bluff. And the reason I think that is because it's going to be really hard for my opponent to call an overbet on this run out with a one pair hand. I think they have a bunch of one pair hands in their range. I think all the like pocket fours through pocket eights are there. I think they have a bunch of 9x combinations. But even if they do have an overpair or trips that check the turn, which I think like it's less likely they do, it's going to be a really hard call off when I do go ahead and bet really big. Them knowing I have four houses in my range, I have flushes in my range. So I go ahead and bet 44, got my fingers crossed that the opponent does fold, and then they go ahead and fold. So absolutely stoked with my play on this hand. Probably got lucky that the flush did get there on the river. Otherwise, I don't know if I would have had the opportunity to bluff at it, but this is just a good spot where I'm using the fact that, that I have a very strong range of hands in my range it just is a really good opportunity for me to bluff and i take down this pot as a result okay last interesting hand for the session but i promise you we've got a doozy to cap it off so the action falls to me in the hijack with pocket nines go ahead and open it up for three then a loose aggressive opponent in the cutoff calls and we go heads up to a flop 853 rainbow the action's on me here and already i have a pretty interesting decision whether i want to see bet or check and i actually think i much prefer checking to my opponent on this i think they have a bunch of like over cards to the eight in their range which are probably just going to fold when i bet but being that they're a loose aggressive opponent they're probably going to be slightly more inclined to bluffing with you know like a king queen and also we give them an opportunity to value bet a worse hand like ace eight suited or eight nine suited or eight seven like this is straight draws as well that they can semi bluff with so i think it's just a good opportunity to go ahead and induce a bet from the opponent then look what happens, they go ahead and bet 2.75, pretty small bet, so I do think there is merit to check raising here, just to try and get, win a bigger pot from an 8 essentially, but or a straight draw. I just like to call, however, I just think this opponent has so many of those like King Queen, Jack 10 type hands in their range, that I just really want them to pick up some equity on the turn and keep on betting. It might be a bit of a mistake though, because those cards can obviously hit a stronger pair than us, which is concerning, so maybe there's merit to check raising to deny equity as well. Yeah, I might have just talked myself around. Maybe this is a mistake. Regardless, so I called. Then we're heads up to the turn. Six of diamonds. The action's on me. I check it over to the aggressor. They keep betting at it. They go ahead and bet 10. I think at this point, it's less likely that they are betting a one pair hand for value. And they definitely do have a six suited in their cutoff call call range. So they definitely could be betting that hand for value now. So I'm slightly concerned I'm behind. Plus, I definitely could have all the sets on this board too, probably even pocket sixes to be honest. So I'm somewhat concerned behind, but regardless, still not gonna fold, still beat all those overcards uh, combinations. Those overcard combinations could have picked up a flush draw as well. So there's a bunch of hands I'm head off. So not going anywhere with my nines. I throw in the call, seven hearts. 
It's a pretty good river for us. We do river A stripe. The action's on me, and I want to keep checking it over to my opponent here. I think if my opponent does have one of those overcard hands I've talked about, like, there's a pretty good chance I'll bluff this river. Like, this is going to be a scary river for, you know, if I was just planning to check call down with, you know, pocket aces or pocket jacks, whatever, over pair. Like, this is going to be an absolute scare card for me, and I think there's a very high chance they're going to bluff at it. Plus, additionally, I think it is somewhat possible that they're just going to keep betting a two-pair or set hand for value, just because it looks like I have an overpair. They don't know I've got an overpair that's now straight, though. So, I go ahead and check it to them. They go ahead and bet 20. Now, that the action's on me, and I think at this stack depth, we have a no-brainer decision but to rip it all in. I think it's pretty likely that my opponent will fold just because they don't have a straight, but we're just like free rolling, whether they call off with their set or their two pair. I do think that, you know, it could look like we're bluffing here. I guess they maybe have one combination of 10-9 of diamonds that kept bluffing on the turn. So, I mean, could be valuating myself, but I think besides that one combination, we're just free rolling a call from a worst hand with the shove here. Hopefully it looks like we're turning an over pair into a bluff and they're going to call off with a set. And then they throw in the call with ace four of diamonds. So they actually had the worst straight, pretty brutal river for them. They get there, but they don't know that we get there better. So absolutely running super hot. And this is why I sort of had a bigger win towards the end of the session because I kept booking wins in hands like this. Let's go. So that was it. Those were the most interesting hands I played across the course of the session. Definitely a lot of very, very interesting hands in that mix. So hop in the comments below. Let me know what you think of how I played those hands. There's so many like interesting different individual spots that could have done differently. Always super, super curious to hear your opinions on those hands. And as you can see by the graph here, definitely a surge towards the end where we started winning bigger and bigger pots, including some of the ones we went over for sure. In terms of my gameplay from today's session, I'm going to go with a B. I really do like a lot of the decisions I made. I think particularly towards the end, with hands like that ace-jack where I turn it into a bluff, like with that pocket nines where I kept checking to induce bets from my opponents, I think I was really in tune to what my opponents were doing and exploiting their tendencies very, very well. Towards the start of the session though, to be honest, I think I was playing a bit too passive, not check-raising the queen three, folding the ace king on the river. I think probably just a bit too of a timid mindset and playing a bit too passive. Having said that, like in these games, I would probably rather be playing too passive than too aggressive, but I do think there is a healthy balance in between. And if I played how I did for the last bit of the session at the start, I would have given myself an A today, but I just can't quite go there when I'm not finding that perfect balance throughout the entirety of the session. So feel like a B is pretty accurate for today. That's going to bring us to the end of the vlog today. I've got a training session at 9pm, trying to get back into shape, so I've hired a personal trainer. The restrictions in Melbourne have loosened a bit, so I'm actually going to go to the local park to meet the personal trainer, and he's going to bring all the like barbells and weights and stuff, so going to get a proper workout in, which I'm actually pretty stoked for. It's 8am at the moment, so I have to go do that at 9, so i got to wrap this vlog up. Thank you so much for sticking all the way to the end of the video. It really does help the channel's analytics, so I do appreciate it. If you haven't already, leave a comment. Let me know what you think about all the different interesting decision points across the course of this session. I played so many interesting hands, and I am super, super curious to hear your opinion on them. Also, leave a thumbs up on the video. It helps the analytics as well. And the best thing you can do is hit that subscribe button to help the channel grow. For now, I've got to go lift some weights, so I'm out of here. Peace.